as consistently as possible and as much as I can. I begin my Sundays with a ritual of water, fire and air from the burning candle's flame, and earth in the form of Mbepo and snuff. A ritual of Upatla, where I speak to my ancestors through these energy forces sustaining all life on this earth we inhabit. These integral parts of matter, of our physical universe. Every work I create has to speak of uh, environmental crisis, social crisis, socio-political crisis. Dominant conversations about ecological justice are framed in the co-opting language of whiteness, often absolving it of any accountability. I've worked for more formal um, institutions. Um, that's where I started my conservation um, career and it just didn't sit well with me. Uh, a lot of answers weren't, um, a lot of questions weren't being answered. Uh, the people around me didn't have the answers in terms of why only certain people um, have access to the spaces that we protect, why we only do conservation in certain areas and people couldn't answer those questions. Um, I started seeing that a lot of our work was being done um, in spaces that were in close proximity to white bodies all the time. I'm very African to an extent that anything that uh, affects the continent and the people, uh, it's, it's, it's my enemy. Uh, since I don't have power to combat or to fight it in a physical form, I use my work to, to fight. In the same way that Africa's history didn't begin in 1884, with the Berlin Conference, Colonialism and Whiteness, our histories and practices of ecological work are just as old as our indigenous cultures. These are things that are thrown away anyway, while they still have value. But due to their technological advancement, they, they don't have value in the eyes of some. Fire, water, earth and air being so integral to Isintu, to our traditional African spiritual and cultural practices, is but affirmation that our relationship with ecology is not only long-spanning, but also incredibly deep. That it is a relationship rooted in community, one as old as our ways of making life, keeping memory and passing on stories. As we make our way through this journey, these cultures and their ancient practices become our companions, along with artists whose work and methods creatively dance around spectrums of time, space and place, and matter. It is not actually waste. It is a waste because you don't need it. It's because of our mindset. But when you see a need for it, you see that there's someone else that you can transform it into something beautiful, then it is no longer a waste. What is that thing that I have that I can use in making environmental impacts? I know that I can weave very well. How can I use my weaving skills? We've started forgetting about our own tradition, especially when it comes to even wearing our own, um, like using our local clothes for our wedding and everything. And now I ask people, why are you no longer using our shoe again? Why do you not want to be wearing our local this thing again? So they say it is too heavy. It is not attractive. So we came up with an innovative solution to make sure that it is now attractive and lighter. Our indigenous practices proliferate the dominant language of ecological justice with decolonial and reclaimed ways of thinking about ecological preservation. Fine, we all want a clean environment, but we don't mind where these wastes, where they are ending up. And it's actually a major problem because most of us, once we see solution, we don't mind if it's causing problems to other people or not. I work with traditional plant practices, traditional plant human intimacies in the Northern Cape. And I try to bring a lot of that work um, to Princess Frey and to Cape Town um, with the projects that I do um, with the communities over here. 
For Indigenous people, creative expression isn't just a conduit for our imagination, but it is also deeply embedded in our ways of making life and being in relationship with the planet. The fact that I made an artwork out of like cow shit. I did furniture, I made furniture out of cow dung. And it was quite interesting to learn about um, the institution and materiality and trying to combine those two elements together. I was trying to break this idea of quality in materials and quality in ideas and I was just putting it together, yeah. That's why I make art. I'm trying to, I'm trying to change the narrative. I'm trying to understand the narrative as well, and I'm trying to realize it in a sense that it makes sense to me, and I'm giving the opportunity for other people to also realize it in a different way. The work produced and practices engaged with by these artists signal towards the fact that there's an urgent need to reimagine our relationship with the planet and the way we imagine our ecological futures. Essentially, my work seeks to defy that fundamental understanding of what colonialism is, which is and stating boundaries and stating borders and stating rules and stating everything that essentially is made to just make you controlled and conform to certain things. So for me, it's also revealed how intricate and detailed and how ritualistic everyone has been with understanding the environment and using that to their advantage here, especially in Africa. Really all my work has to do with um, how to sort of reintroduce what we have thrown away back into ourselves by preserving it through wearing outfits. And I guess that's also a lot of understanding with saving items, saving the land, saving the dried plants, saving the raffia, saving the bark of the tree, saving cotton, saving waste, saving plastic. I see plastic as the best medium to channel my energy with. Using of plastic in my work is very, very repetitive. And that repetition of using the same material gave me a moment of reflection. And that moment of reflection also served as a moment of looking at myself, looking at my past, and also looking at my community and also Nigeria at large. Every artist has their own, has their own space of getting inspiration, but for me, I can boldly say this, that I'm a child of the water. Hegemonic conversations around ecological justice and climate change tend to be framed in the language of individualism, a logic of capitalism and one of colonialism, that bombards us with slogans of recycling, veganism, vegetarianism and sustainability. In the Western world, climate justice as individual thing. Uh, while in Africa, it, there's so many factors that are, are connected to that. You cannot separate it. What these elements give us as people who've been made marginal is a cosmology and sites of knowledge, memory and connection that reach beyond their material realities and the extractive logic of white capitalist supremacy. There's so much about that deep connection between people and land as custodians that honor and um, in many ways stabilize environmental systems, but also ensure that they are regenerative and not extractive. Reminding us that these are not only places we turn to for our physical nourishment. We come from oral tradition. These recipes are not written down. And when they are written down, it's through this like very weird colonial lens um, that ethnicizes and, and does all these very strange things. And so we become so detached and removed from our own food and our own people and our own land. A lot of people don't understand the injustices that people live with every single day. 
and how you know majority of the land is still owned by very few basically white men that have been owning it for many many years what were we doing before colonizers intruded how were we eating and it takes just a few moments or just a few thoughts to realize that the land was so wealthy and we say generous but because of those ecocides and, and, and genocides a lot of that knowledge and those species are lost but it is also to them we turn for spiritual sustenance to commune with our ancestors to remember things lost stolen and disappeared and to return to ourselves because we are still denying the the, the, the right to know our historical backgrounds, you know. So, and when that happened, they gave back to a generation that do not have a knowledge of history. So until we begin to know our compass in the world, that this is our duty to do, the artist's job is not to depict the problem of society, but the motivations for those deeds. The world is changing and waste is going to be a thing of the past. Same like uh, carbon was a big thing back in the day, still is, shouldn't be, but we're getting somewhere, you know. Um, that's what I think about waste is going to be. It's going to be something of the past. Uh, very soon our kids and our grandkids are going to be waste. There's nothing to be wasted. Our environments, this is, this is where we breed, like whatever we throw into our environment, that is what to, it, to, it to throw back at us. A custodianship means to be a caregiver and a caretaker of land and not to see yourself as separate from the land. So there's that kinship. And kinship um, between person and land means that you recognize a shared origin and a shared ancestry with land. And so that's something that I bring into my teaching in, in, with my environmental education is kinship custodianship, which are indigenous cosmologies. Those are indigenous frameworks of how to be with the land. It was our, it was our call to try and uh, do something better. Uh, try and find better solution to the current system. I do believe that if you give people the alternative and you actually empower them, you can do a lot. And if you do it in a sustainable way, you are looking for a perfect system, you know, and that is all what Mondo for Africa is about. Uh, trying to bring sustainability into everyday's, uh, into everyday's people's lives.